Five minute warning. Ba 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 ta 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 ta.
this. Okay. Welcome everyone to the first PLC for the 2019-2020 school year. I am Sarah Burns with Alberta Education Low Incidence Team. We are supported today by the great people of the Film Lab of Alberta Education, WizCap for captioning and Tanya Adler for ASL interpretation. Before I introduce um, our presenter, I'd like to make a note of a save the date. Um, on October 9th, we've been invited uh, to a PLC with Dr. Nicole Grove from the UK to speak about the implications of adopting a holistic and multimodal approach to communications. The webinar is based on the research and practice drawn together in the first ever text dedicated to the topic of manual sign acquisition in children with developmental disabilities. I will send out additional information at the beginning of next week. So this, this week's, um, this month's PLC is the adoption of telepractice to support intervention with uh, Dr. Uh, Stedler Brown. Um, and just to give you a little bit of information about Dr. Brown, she uh, provides consultation and technology assistance in programs working with children who are deaf and hard of hearing in the United States and internationally. She has a graduate degree as a speech language pathologist an educator of the deaf and hard of hearing, and the doctorate degree in special education. Her research has focused on telepractice, and she's a co-investigator for phase two clinical trial funded by the National Institutes on Health and National Institute on Communication Disorders and Deafness to study services to children who are deaf and hard of hearing via telepractice. Dr. Stedler Brown works with initiatives promoting evidence based early intervention practices and the use of individualized assessments to inform treatment. She's a busy person. She also teaches at the University of UBC, sorry, the University of British Columbia, and holds a position as in the clinical faculty of speech language hearing clinics at the University of Colorado. She has many other research interests, and like many Albertans, loves the outdoors, camping, and hiking. And with that, I'm going to switch it over to Dr. Brown. Well, hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Uh, do I sound OK? If I don't hear otherwise, I'll assume it's a go. Um, lovely to be uh, working with you today. Please um, ask your questions as they come up. No need to save them for the um, end of the talk. Um, and uh, Sarah or Elena, should I just tell you when to advance the slide? I'm ready. So a few things that I'm going to hit on today. And again, if you have questions for me, please ask them and I can spend more time on any of these topics but I'm going to look a little bit at how telepractice has gotten started and uh, some of the pros and cons that we hear around the world. I'm going to um, look at how telepractice impacts your team, educational audiologists and teachers of the deaf and hard of hearing and speech language pathologists, of course, as well. Uh, I have some research to share that looks at the efficacy of telepractice and then its effectiveness when it's applied in schools and in early intervention. And um, some practical tips for professionals who are getting involved in telepractice. Next slide. The highlighted word there, telepractice, I know is what Alberta or your project is, um, your system is using, uh, but you're going to see lots of terms relating to 
this idea of delivering services virtually. Um, it kind of all started with telemedicine because hospitals, at least in the US, got involved in it. And uh, the rehabilitation fields, psychology, speech language pathology, audiology, are kind of riding on the coattails, if you will, of the medical community. Uh, and then education um, came on board a little bit later in the US. So I'm happy to hear how um, Alberta and uh, also Nova Scotia had a nice conversation this week with Sue Lay at APSI, how um, schools are beginning to uh, launch into telepractice. Um, I might slip sometimes and say telehealth, that's the term we use here in the US, uh, and that, or at least in Colorado, I should say, uh, that's tied to our reimbursement system for healthcare services, whole different world from what's happening up there in Canada. And we also hear terms like teleservice, telecare, uh, Nova Scotia, APSI is calling it distance services, and doesn't have tele in the name at all. So as you read or listen uh, to different people, uh, read different articles, you're gonna see all of these terms and uh, best I can tell they're pretty interchangeable. Next slide. So there are some myths and we can stop there for a second. And at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna pop these same questions up uh, or these same statements. I'm calling these myths, we've been, hearing them for the last, how long have I been involved? Since about 2002, uh, I've been hearing these types of statements. The technology always lets us down. Next one, families don't like telepractice. Next one, telepractice is never as good as in-person sessions. And the last one, Telepractice is a good option when there are no other options. I don't want to say that these are unequivocally right or wrong, but I do think that there's enough evidence to address all of them to uh, maybe suggest that we've moved beyond them. Next slide, please. So uh, in preparing for this talk today, I uh, did some uh, investigation, especially around school age services and picked up some interesting quotes from what others have experienced. I love this um, statement from an article. It's at the end, all the references that I mention are at the end of this talk. Uh, Tucker, about seven years ago said, telepractice is going to happen anyway. So let's prepare for this. And I'll tell you this about our um, study here at the University of Colorado that's funded by our federal government. Our project officer said to us, telepractice is going to happen even if the federal government doesn't regulate it or write rules about it. So we want to fund your study because we want to understand if it's effective or not. So from a research perspective or from a federal government perspective in the US, it, there, the same thing is being said is what Tucker here said seven years ago. It's probably going to happen anyway, so let's get ready. Next slide. Why should we jump into this? I've spoken with Sarah a little bit, um, Sarah Burns there in Alberta, uh, to understand your situation in general, our experience in Colorado and many other uh, places around the world. Say, uh, uh, next slide it reduces travel time. And again, from the Tucker article, I love that one of their interventionists or therapists, teachers, I'm not sure who it was, said, I can move 120 miles in 45 seconds. Now that really resonates in Colorado. We have the Rocky Mountains going through our state. I don't know about Alberta. I'm not sure where the Rockies are up there in Canada, which province they're in. But uh, I do know that you have a huge geographic area and um, moving 120 miles in 45 seconds is not such a bad idea. Uh, we have weather considerations here in Colorado for sure that makes this appealing. Another uh, reason for telepractice, kids can get more services, uh, especially kids in rural areas where there aren't providers. 
especially in places where there's inclement weather, which would keep someone from getting to services, keeping an uh, itinerant teacher, for instance, or an SLP from getting to the school. And um, what I'm hearing around Colorado is people are very sensitive to spreading germs these days, and uh, kids and providers alike. And sometimes someone doesn't feel so bad that they can't work, but they don't feel like they wanna show up in person and spread their germs around. Um, I love this next purpose for telepractice and uh, Sule in Nova Scotia reinforced it uh, by telling me what one of her providers had to say, which was very much as I'm quoting here from the Heinz et al article, telepractice, provides new ways to practice. And for some therapists, they feel like they get more animated and they become more excited about it. From the Tucker article, they said, providers have a chance to do something new. And I've had huge professional growth because of it. Someone else said, we want to be cutting edge. All of those definitely apply. Uh, it's like being a surfer and being on the wave, uh, the top of the wave. Uh, to get started at the very beginning of things. Um, another reason for telepractice is school-age children tend to be pretty motivated by technology, right? Not to mention their parents. A lot of the millennials are absolutely fine with technology. That's a theme that's gonna keep coming up. Um, some school-age kids, especially the older ones, like not being, um, let me just say it reduces the stigma of being pulled out for services because they're going to the computer lab or the room with the computer to do something virtual, which is in vogue. And um, students also receive some reinforcement materials for practice or to take to their classroom. And they can get those electronically and share them electronically. And that's so appealing to young kids these days. Another reason uh, from the Tucker article, when students are engaged through the computer, they seem to uh, be more responsive, more engaged and more responsive. More responses can increase a student's practice with the material and um, hopefully increase student learning. A Couple more on the next slide. Maybe we as providers can learn more too. With the push of a button as Terry or someone did on your end for this webinar, you can record a session, just like he's recording this webinar. And um, I don't know if anyone has done this since their pre-service training at university, but if you ever watch yourself in a session, there's lots to learn. So we as providers can learn more and the students, um, uh, uh, let me make another point as a provider, you can go back, I have my students in our clinic here do this all the time. I say, look at your session, watch what you did, collect the baseline data, look at your progress notes, sessions down the way. Something that might be hard to do in session, but you can use that recording to um, monitor kids' progress and to watch yourself. And that's to the second point. Um, providers tend to do more coaching when, um, they're working uh, through telepractice. And Sarah shared with me that you have a consultative model and a consultative model is kind of the same as coaching. You're going to be teaching adults something that you have figured out with the student. And um, uh, that happens more frequently in the telepractice condition. Since you have a teaming approach for kids with, who are deaf and hard of hearing between educational audiologists, teachers of the deaf and hard of hearing and speech language pathologists. This is an excellent way to collaborate. You can share recordings. You can be in two different places, students in a third place. You can do a session together. Travel is not an issue. So um, a lot of added flexibility to our job. Um, in Colorado with our birth to three population, with kids with all types of disabilities, they got started in telepractice because um, we weren't able to get services to all kids as quickly as they needed to be delivered as soon as the child was um, identified with a disability. 
and our federal government gives us a timeline and says services must start in 28 days. Well, we were not meeting that criteria and we were hoping telepractice would help to meet that. And um, I don't know what your interpreter thinks, but both for sign language interpreting and for other lang oral spoken language interpreting, uh, this is an easy way to include an interpreter. So lots of reasons to do telepractice, but there are issues when you're on the cutting edge of something new. If you would go to the next slide, please. And I'm going to start with changing attitudes about people. I think that this has been a huge barrier. I think that it makes sense. It's logical. We're telling people who were trained to work with people in person to change that service delivery approach, to embrace it, to give it a try. And sometimes people are uncomfortable with that change for a lot of good reasons. So let's look at some of the changes in attitudes that might need to happen. Again, please. There you go. Um, in this Heinz et al. article, um, it, they were saying that the providers they interviewed uh, identified their initial feelings about starting telepractice and it fell into three conditions. So I'm going to show you those and ask you just to think a little bit about which of those three categories applies to you. So if you'd advance that, there you go. Are you excited about the potential? Albeit maybe you're uncertain about its effectiveness or are you unsure how to do it? Therefore, maybe not so comfortable with, uh, with starting or maybe a mixture of those two. If we were in person, you'd be raising your hands, but I'll just let you think about it for now. And if you'd advance to the next, uh, there you go. Here's the good news. Attitudes of therapists are said to change once that interventionist starts telepractice. So whichever category described you, chances are it's gonna change once you start doing telepractice. And a couple of quotes from these articles I've been looking at, one person said, I'm amazed how something so different, that being telepractice, is so similar to in-person therapy at the same time. And again, this theme of providers saying, I saw new ways to practice. And that's basically a good thing. Uh, a couple more points about attitude. There you go. The provider needs to be more flexible. That's true. Uh, the provider needs to be a little bit more organized. Um, this whole idea of collaboration starting with teachers of the deaf, speech language pathologists, educational audiologists for kids who are deaf and hard of hearing. Uh, let's add in collaboration with the general education teacher. Let's add in parents, especially for the young children. In the US, that's birth to three. I think in Nova Scotia, it's birth to five. I'm not sure about Alberta. Um, there's collaboration with the facilitator who might be bringing this student from their classroom to the telepractice session. In the literature, we're referring to that person these days as an e-helper. I don't know if that terminology will last, but I see it used a lot. I see facilitator used a lot too. So, you know, best practice for in-person intervention is all that collaboration would happen anyway. But there's something about telepractice that actually makes it a little bit easier. You don't have to drive anywhere. You don't have to walk down the hall. You don't have to find out if the person is uh, uh, in the classroom and you have to come back later. You just electronically arrange a time to meet and to collaborate or to sign into your session. And it seems to be, um, telepractice seems to give us an advantage for that. And um, if you could, do a couple more, or at least there you, you can keep going. Two more, that, stop, whoops, go back, okay. Let me say that besides just jumping in and doing telepractice, 
there is a lot of evidence that some training prior to starting might be advantageous. And I like the way that the article by uh, Heinz et al. Uh, four years ago identified some of the priorities that providers want before they start telepractice. Uh, that would be training in the technology, like Zoom, some practice with the hardware, and the software is maybe any online materials that you're accessing for your therapy sessions or teaching sessions. Observing colleagues who are already comfortable with telepractice, they can record their session. You as a person new to telepractice can watch it, see what's the same, what's different, which could become to the next point a formal mentor prog process if your agency were so inclined. And uh, assuring that your access to resources is different if you feel it needs to be different. And we'll go into more detail about that later. So when it comes to attitudes, I'm kind of looking at what is and uh, what we might do to help. And uh, in the next few slides, I'm actually gonna show you, you can go to the next one, the results of a recent study that um, we, a few of us published in the International Journal of Telemedicine or Telerehabilitation about um, the attitude of providers serving all types of kids with all types of disabilities all the children were birthed to three years of age. And we surveyed providers and we have service coordinators who are kind of overseers of each child's program. They, they see the children when they start intervention and periodically throughout the three years they might be in intervention. We also surveyed parents and administrators, but we didn't get enough uh, return on those surveys. So I'm gonna share with you the results of um, what providers and service coordinators of children birthed three said, and this was in the state of Colorado. Now, the next slide before you go there, oops, well, there it is, that's fine. Well, whatever. Um, I want to share that once Colorado said all birth to three providers, hundreds and hundreds of them could do telepractice. And after three years, now the next slide, as of March 2008, that very small percentage of providers were actually doing it. Now, the state endorsed it. The state paid for it, state of Colorado. They promoted it. They had online training modules, but uptake was really low. And we thought, okay, what's the problem? And it comes down to attitude. If you'll go to the next slide, please. Here were the positives. Go ahead and there you go. Let's stop there for a minute. The positives were, it addresses provider shortages. It's appropriate for rural families. It's flexible in terms of scheduling and weather and illness like I was talking about earlier. Less travel, another theme that keeps recurring. The providers and the service coordinators like the flexibility. Interventionists could, uh, instead of going at one o'clock every Thursday, they might more easily be able to join a family during eating time or dressing time or transitioning to the car time, whatever was a challenge for a family. They thought the families were more involved in the intervention. And um, they said that coaching strategies were used more. And then there were the negative attitudes. And that'll be the next. One thing is technology. The next is it's less personal. And the next is the perception that families didn't like it. The next few slides might 
debunk some of those notions. Next slide. This is a slide from the interventionists. These could have been speech language pathologists, occupational therapists, uh, physical therapists, psychologists, social workers, any provider. So we said, okay, we asked this question, one among many, compared to children you see in person, the children I see in telepractice sessions make more progress, 8%. Kids did better in telepractice. Same amount of progress in person and in telehealth, telepractice, that would be the blue bar, and that's 80%. Make the same amount of progress. And we have, uh, what's the percentage there that think they make less progress? It would be about 12%. Next slide. We also, in the same provider survey, Another question was, compared to families I see in person, the parents or caregivers who are involved in the telehealth session are blue bar. More than 50% say the parents were equally involved. Green bar at the top, 33% say that the parents were more involved in the telepractice condition. And then we have about 14% that say parents were less involved. This is another theme you're going to see. Coaching seems to happen at least the same, if not more, in telepractice. And what's the value of coaching? Well, if you as a provider are assigned to a child, a speech-language pathologist sees the child an hour a week or two 20-minute sessions a week, but you teach the people, the teachers, other team members, parents, how to implement those strategies, then that child, that student is exposed to those strategies more often. Maybe kids will do better. We'll see. Maybe, maybe they do equally well. That data comes later. The next slide, please. Uh, this was a question that we asked the service coordinators, those uh, people monitoring the children in the system. And we have a problem here, I think, in terms of why telepractice is not being used more. How many said it was wonderful? Um, about 12%. 53%, the blue bar, said it's okay in some situations. That is not a resounding endorsement of telepractice. The yellow bar, was um, I haven't recommended it, but I'm open to it. That's about 22%. And the orange bar at the bottom, 11% said, mm -mm, not interested. I'm not gonna recommend it. And the next slide to that point, uh, again, please, said, a service coordinator said, being rural, she, her, her, her area was a rural part of Colorado, she said, I don't want families to think they're getting a lesser version of therapy. Another myth that hopefully by the end of this webinar, you'll raise your eyebrows and maybe question. We'll see. So if we're going to, oh, actually before you go on, any questions I should be aware of? I don't see that any are there, but it's kind of a, a, a logical pausing point. So if you have a question, please type it and it'll show up for me. Okay, let's move on. So who needs to be informed about telepractice? And I couldn't help but put in this word in parentheses, who needs to be convinced to engage in telepractice? And it's kind of everybody, school district personnel, the students, the parents, the SLPs, maybe the teachers of the deaf and hard of hearing too, or the educational audiologists, uh, probably could have said just providers. And this uh, statement from an uh, article in 2010, Dunkley and colleagues said, research has suggested that disparities exist between clinicians, the providers, and the clients, 
students' perspectives, with the therapists often displaying more negative attitudes than others who are interested in promoting telepractice or those who are receiving telepractice. And that's what we see with the service coordinators in Colorado. Next slide. So how do we convince everybody or influence them? So with administrators and teachers and maybe parents, how about watching a telepractice session? That might eliminate some preconceived ideas. Or to administrators, let's train the providers. That short list I showed you earlier. Let's train them on the technology. Let's train them by having them watch others do it. Maybe create a mentorship program. And that's in the Bail and Khan article and also the Heinz article. And establish your credibility so that providers can collaborate with parents, e-helpers, other teachers who are physically present with the student during a telepractice session. If you're all set to go and you start, we may have the provider convinced, but we also need to be sensitive to the attitude of more naive people. And since you're working in a consultative model there in Alberta, it sounds like that orange bullet at the bottom pretty much applies. Some tips on the next slide. Um, when you're getting started as a telepractice practitioner, you might send some type of a letter of introduction to the student, to the teacher, to your colleagues, send it electronically, however you want to do it, uh, invite them to watch a session so that you can demonstrate what it looks like. I think the idea of hybrid services is very popular hybrid being some in-person sessions, some telepractice sessions. And I'm going to take a second to talk about our uh, colleagues in Australia who are working with children who are deaf and hard of hearing. And I can share Melissa McCarthy, uh, Dimity Dorn, Ellen Rhodes, a bunch of people in the field of working with kids who are deaf and hard of hearing have done a lot of work with telepractice and they, really built some of their service delivery models on telepractice because of the size of the country and where the population lived and where the providers were. And uh, they didn't do much of a hybrid model. They were pretty much launched into telepractice 100% of their sessions with many of their families because they just couldn't wait to organize in-person sessions. But I find in the US, uh, where that challenge is not quite as significant, that um, sometimes when practitioners can do some in-person sessions and some telepractice sessions, it's a way to ease into telepractice. Just an FYI. So once telepractice is underway, you can have some informational sessions, perhaps through email or webinars uh, so that you can discuss telepractice and demonstrate to people who want to learn about it, what it looks like. Um, you can send an email to teachers or send a, something printed out with the student that goes back to their classroom teacher. You can report on how the child is doing. Um, I don't think any of these are required. They're all optional. And then over time, if one is so inclined, uh, you can get some satisfaction surveys. And I have some articles with great satisfaction questions that I'm happy to share with you. And uh, I know how busy everyone is, but even a very short occasional newsletter, maybe not monthly, maybe per semester, might be a nice way to um, share with your colleagues this whole idea of delivering services through telepractice. Okay, next slide.
What's different about telepractice from in-person sessions? And there's three areas that I'll hit on. Engaging the recipient of the services, the student, selecting your materials, managing the technology. Let's look at the next slide, engaging clients, engaging your students. For one, think about your eye contact. You have to establish eye contact, not by looking at your camera, keep your eye on the students. I suggest not watching yourself. It can be very distracting. Um, the next point is how do you give directions? You might find you need to be more descriptive in giving directions to students, especially if they're old enough that they don't have an e-helper or a facilitator or another teacher with them. And when it comes to these e-helpers, again, in your situation, maybe it's a, another teacher or a teacher's aide, um, assign some tasks to those e-helpers, like scheduling, bringing the student to the class, to the room where the telepractice session is taking place. Let them be trained in the use of technology and to handle any technology problems. Uh, something you can't see just because of the way the slide was reformatted is uh, a fourth point, which is um, the person sitting there with the student can help to be sure the student stays in the view of the camera so that you can see them. And I'm not going to go into great detail about this, but there are devices, uh, for instance, something called Swivel, S-W-I-V-L. It's an acronym, it's, or it's the name of a product uh, that you can put an iPad on and it moves to follow the voices or the action or um, even thinking about using an iPad versus a computer because iPads can be so easily turned even if you're just holding it. Um, when I was talking with Sule in Nova Scotia at APSI, she was talking about the um, facilitators that they have or whoever is there accompanying the student can um, uh, get more opportunities to be a good coach for that student by being engaged in a session. So you can actually be teaching that person some things to try right there while you're watching with the student. Um, I see a question has popped up. I'm going to address that in just a minute. Let me point out two more things about engaging clients on the next slide. I've mentioned about giving directions and this quote kind of says it all. We've learned to refine how we give direction and we're more descriptive. Oh, I already said that actually. And it can take place of being physically present. Sorry for the duplication. Let me point out a word of caution. And this applies maybe more to the little ones. Should any of you be working with young children in the home? But I was at a presentation this summer and the presenter was from New Zealand. And she said that she felt like in a good way, she was on call all the time. And that the parents of these young children could check in with her all times of the day, any day of the week, during mealtime or something they wanted to show the therapist that was just really special. And this therapist was fine with that. But I want to point out that while the technology might allow you to do that, because you can Zoom on your phone, it's easy to get in touch. It is not essential to telepractice to do that. It was her preference, her choice, that particular provider's choice. She liked it, she advocated for it, but I'm still going to suggest it is a personal preference of the provider or the teacher or the therapist. Um, so, something that people are doing, but not necessarily something I want to, you to think is uh, required. The question that's up, maybe you can all see it. Uh, do I have experience using telepractice with indigenous families in remote locations? 
Um, I don't. We don't have, um, we have a couple of what we call Native American tribes in Colorado. Uh, they're small and uh, we have not used telepractice that I'm aware with them, but in my work with um, fan, uh, uh, British Columbia, um, they have reported on its use, the use of telepractice with indigenous families in remote locations. And uh, here are the things that I learned, and this is from my colleague Noreen Simmons at the BC Family Hearing Resource Society. They work specifically with children who are deaf and hard of hearing birth through, at least through elementary. I'm not sure if they go older than that. And they have said that some of these things help them with indigenous families in remote locations. And that is to be sure that you have an indigenous provider uh, with the child. Um, and I think there was some work that was done before they started the telepractice to be sure that the community embraced telepractice. And I think that as with anyone that you're talking to about starting telepractice, you need to individualize how you tell and maybe sell the idea. Uh, this wouldn't be specific to indigenous families, but the more remote you get, the more issues you're going to have, you might have with bandwidth, with having adequate bandwidth. Um, I think Zoom, which we're using now, has been fantastic. Uh, that means the software is great, but sometimes the bandwidth is not good enough or even accessible enough that, to have a really good, clear signal. I'll talk a little bit more about what might be done about that. But again, talking with uh, Sule at APSI in Nova Scotia the other day, she said that one of the issues they had is that the schools keep creating firewalls for security purposes. And so their program needs to keep getting permission to get through the firewall. Um, it's another access issue when it comes to remote areas um, and security issues. So um, those are some tips about, uh, that I've learned about working with indigenous families. Uh, the next question, uh, for students who are hear hard of hearing using hearing technology, how can this be facilitated? Listening through a computer can be challenging. Have I heard of any issues with the auditory signal? Absolutely. Um, and I have more slides about that uh, when we get into the equipment. But let me just say this for starters. Um, there are remote microphones that can be used. There are remote headphones that can be used. Of course, you can't necessarily use headphones when you have hearing technology, but there's Bluetooth connection and whatnot so that you can have some wireless uh, support for um, kids who are hard of hearing. Uh, and I don't wanna say too awfully much because I'm stepping into the world of educational audiologists, but I know you have them. So I would look at, uh, to them for some suggestions on the best um, uh, support that you can give for kids who are using hearing aids or cochlear implants to make the sound uh, clearer for them. Uh, interestingly, Terry, who's one of your tech people there, and I did a test yesterday to make sure everything was working. And I was using my microphone on my computer. And then I said, I happen to have a headset here with a noise canceling microphone. Let me put that on and see if the quality of sound is any different. And I don't know what you've got going there in Alberta, but he said the sound sounded great, like I was next door to him, and it did not change with the microphone or the headset uh, at all. So um, I think computers are help computer technology is helping us out because it's getting better and better all the time. And the microphones are better and better all the time on the computers, but still an important question for kids with hearing technology. Uh, let's see, hard of hearing educational audiologists here, yay. Uh, I've had great success with Google Meet for remote sessions. There's a captioning option, thanks for mentioning that. And while it's not perfect, it's extremely helpful and helps fill in the blanks of anything I may not have heard. 
Uh, it's the same technology as Google Translate. It's an Android app. Uh, thank you, Melanie. Um, okay, I'll keep watching the box. Next slide. And Sarah or Elena, if I don't look at the box, just speak up and tell me to, to <laughs> tell me to look or, or read the question. Um, materials. What do we do for materials that's different in telepractice? Planning is kind of essential. And I'm a kind of a spur of the moment kind of a interventionist, especially with little ones at home, and I use whatever's in the home. Uh, and with telepractice, you need to plan what you're going to be using in the home uh, when you're doing this uh, via telepractice. Thanks for advancing the slide. Um, use what's readily available. Uh, in the Mellard Rice and Carter article, they said we really have to be good at using what's there. But in some other articles, I've read that um, they just plan in advance, put in a request to the classroom teacher or the principal for what they need um, so that they have access that they want. I think the key is um, plan, plan in advance. Uh, in some uh, programs, and certainly it's documented in articles that have been published, uh, there's duplicate materials in both places where the provider is at the remote site and where the student is at their school. Um, this is kind of a security measure. Uh, it makes it easier to model something when you both have the same materials. I think it's a personal preference. I don't think it's necessary. Uh, 15 years ago, uh, the program at Utah State University actually had a lending library and they sent materials to the home. And it was the same duplicate set of materials that they had, that the therapist had on campus. And then after a month, the family would send those back and they'd get a new box of materials. It's expensive. Shipping materials is expensive. Replacing materials is expensive. Buying duplicate materials is expensive. There's nothing wrong with it. The question is, is it necessary? And for some providers, it feels necessary. And this last point, if you're going to be using computer-based uh, programs, which certainly is easy to do with school-aged children, um, have the tabs on the computer ready, have it open, and uh, don't close, you know, go open a new window and go searching for it during a session. You'll be happy that you had them all in tabs before the session. Next slide, please. Managing the technology that people are so worried about. Um, this is what the Mellard Rice and Carter uh, recent article said about the skills of the provider who is the telepractice provider. They think that the technology skills of the provider only need to be adequate with the expectation that what's hard today is going to be okay tomorrow and eventually it's going to not even be an issue in the future. Technology is just improving that quickly. Uh, back in the early 2000s when I started uh, telepractice at the University of Colorado Hospital, we had a $20,000 piece of equipment and we had a full-time IT person now you can use your phone or an iPad or any kind of notepad, laptop, computer. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but IT support is minimal these days uh, because the technology is so good. Uh, but speaking of technology, next slide. We have, as I've been mentioning, hardware, including additional mics, headsets, Software, um, and that's your Zoom platform or the, uh, uh, what was mentioned here, Google Meet. Um, the HIPAA compliance probably doesn't apply to you. That's a US issue. Well, you may have the same concern about um, security and encrypted secure sites software. For instance, right now we can't use Skype if we're a government agency. 
you can use it personally, but not for a telepractice session with your employer because it's not been deemed secure. And HIPAA is our security law. Um, there are free versions of Zoom, for instance. There's the professional version of Zoom. What's the difference besides the um, free version and the professional version costs about 10 American dollars a month? Um, is that uh, the free version only allows you 45, a 45 minute session and then your session is over. You would have to stop and call back if you wanted to do an hour session. The professional version, you can sign up for a 24 hour session if you were so inclined. Um, and then uh, in the reformatting that we had to do today, I'm not sure you can see this. I can't on my computer anyway. Uh, maybe you can. Um, there's a URL there. Ah, yes. Okay, it was just not visible because something else was popping up on my computer. Um, this www.speedtest.net, um, it'll identify the upload and download speeds on your computer and on the computer uh, that the student or child is using. And there are some guidelines about what are the ideal speeds. Next slide. Before you start telepractice sessions, in uh, the literature, they're calling it onboarding, getting ready. Make sure all the technology works and that it's all where it's supposed to be. Just like Terry and I did a sound check, a technology check yesterday in preparation for today's call. Terry, I don't know if you're there, but I think we finished it in about three minutes and the other 10 minutes we just chatted. <laughs> um, make sure your computer's ready to go, webcams are in place. Uh, be ready maybe before you launch telepractice for the first time to make sure everything's working well. Uh, next slide. Additional equipment, maybe you want an additional monitor. Uh, I was talking with a family that used a laptop and they uh, were showing the session on a very, their large TV screen, LCD screen. They said, well, that didn't work. They thought it was a good idea. It was very distracting. Uh, phone, it's pretty small. Uh, but I know people have used their phones. Um, maybe there are a lot of options, I think, in between. Uh, do you want to use the computer, the device camera, or a separate camera? Uh, there are cameras that you can uh, move on the remote end. You as a provider can be moving the camera that's with the student so that you can keep the student in view. Uh, we talked about mics and uh, here are some other ideas about materials. Do you want to use an interactive whiteboard, a document camera people find handy? Uh, if the room has a lot of reverberation, do you need to adjust things? You can talk to your educational audiologist about that so that you can um, make the sound quality better by changing the environment. Next slide. Uh, Mellard Rice and Carter again said, we typically have some sort of an e-helper with the students. And oftentimes when there are technology issues, <laughs> the kids fix it. They fix it faster than the e-helper can. They know exactly what to do. They just say, oh yeah, right. Just click this button, it fixes the problem. So uh, I love that idea. I just thought it was a cute thing to quote. Next. So this idea of coaching that I keep bringing up, um, kind of moving on here. Um, coaching applies both to early intervention, and I'll show you some data from uh, our uh, study of coaching. And um, coaching, as I mentioned earlier, also applies to your consultative model where your teacher, your SLP, let's say, is teaching the teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing some strategies around 
auditory skill development or speech articulation. Um, but let me show you the data if you would go to the next slide. Um, good. Uh, oh, go back. Thank you. I'm not sure I'm going to play this clip. I'm not going to, um, but there's the URL and you can see Amy Peters Lalios in Wisconsin there to the right. Uh, and it's about a two and a half minute clip and it's quintessential teaching mom on the other end, how to interact with her little guy there, her little son on that monitor. Um, there is no doubt that use of coaching practices increases with um, uh, telepractice. Uh, when I was talking with Sule yesterday, I think whenever earlier this week about uh, coaching, she said this, and she, I totally agree. She said, my interventionist teachers who were good at coaching in person, telepractice is not a problem. My providers who have not learned coach skills in coaching other adults, how to interact, how to work with a child, those who don't know how to be a coach, telepractice is going to be really tough. You need to learn how to be a coach before you start telepractice because um, there are a lot of adults that you want to influence and uh, on behalf of the student that you're working with. So um, I'll just show you, um, if you go to the next slide, a study that I did uh, with kids birth to three, they all had hearing loss. And I compared the use of some coaching strategies in the in-person condition to the telehealth condition, telepractice condition. And if you just advance to the next slide, it shows you that providers observe more in telepractice during a session than when they're in person. They teach, these were young kids under three years of age, under 36 months of age, where we're teaching the parents how to interact with their kids. The providers did a lot more observation when they were watching the parent interacting with their child than uh, in the in-person condition where the providers did more of the work with the child. In the next one, uh, next slide, in the telepractice condition, providers shared more about um, the parents, about what the parent was doing. Um, they didn't do it much in either condition, but they did it more in telepractice. And the next slide would be um, talking to the adult that's with the child about um, how the student is doing. And uh, in the telepractice condition, uh, there was a lot more feedback about the student about, in my study about the children, 7% compared to less than 1% in the in-person condition. And the next slide was uh, teaching the parents what to do with their child. And uh, there was more teaching being done in the in-person condition than in the telepractice condition. Uh, so three of the four behaviors I studied were done more in the telepractice condition. But let's advance to the schools and uh, a study by Mirza this year um, was talking about coaching kids and um, uh, thought that the second bullet there, the student can help to advertise their participation in these virtual sessions, as can the uh, teacher, facilitator, whoever's with the child. Um, let's advance beyond coaching and just look at a little bit of research that I'm pretty excited about. Uh, this is a uh, study that is ongoing right now, as was mentioned, that I'm involved with at the University of Colorado. And this is with children who are deaf and hard of hearing and the ages of those children is six months to seven years. And what we're doing now is we want to see what's the efficacy or effectiveness of telepractice compared to in person on the child outcomes. So we're looking at testing the kids. It's a research study. We test the kids with speech language tests and 
another test uh, of the brain, which I'll explain in a minute. We do all of that baseline testing. We give them six months of treatment. Half those kids have six months of telepractice therapy. Half the kids have six months of in-person therapy. And then we test them again. So if you go to the next slide, let's see how this one looks when it got reformatted. Can you um, push return again? Okay, so, well, that's fine. Um, let me explain the chart to you. Well, I, will my pointer work? Can someone say yes or no? Can you see my pointer? Nope, okay, no pointer. Um, every line on this graph is a child. And every blue line, the child is in the in-person condition. And every red line, the child is in the telepractice condition. And that diagonal black line that goes from bottom right-hand corner to upper right-hand corner is basically saying uh, that's the normal developmental trajectory on the preschool language scale for kids at different ages. And down at the bottom, you'll see that we have two-year-olds, four-year-olds, six-year-olds. And on the vertical axis is their, their total score on the preschool language scale. So pick a line, pick any line, except for the one that's totally horizontal. <laughs> the one blue line is totally horizontal. That child made no progress. But every other line shows a very nice trajectory, starting at the bottom, ending at the dot. Some lines are longer than others because some kids got more than six months of treatment. We started the study with nine months of treatment. We changed it to six months. But you can basically see how kids were making some really nice progress, um, whether they were in person therapy or in tele uh, services. Uh, there was no significant difference in the outcomes for kids. And this was about 20 kids. Um, out of our total group of 70. Interesting point, over the six months, average six months period in, of uh, intervention, kids made almost 10 and a half months growth. We were pretty happy about that. And that was irrespective of which condition they were in. Uh, next, if you hit return, I think another, yeah, uh, no significant effect of the type of therapy. the p-value is insignificant. Now, let me show you the other measure. And when I found out there were educational audiologists on the call, I decided to toss this in. I don't know if you're familiar with cortical auditory evoked potentials or the P1 waveform that's been studied by Dr. Anu Sharma, also at University of Colorado and her colleagues. They're looking at uh, the temporal cortex and looking at how the brain is listening. And that's done with a um, with electrodes pasted to the child's head. The child's in the sound suite and the child is looking at a DVD. They're awake, they're looking at a DVD with no sound, it has captions. And the sound being emitted by the speakers in sound field is ba, the syllable ba. And every second, ba is emitted from the speakers. And the electrodes are picking up the brain's response to that sound. And um, if you go to the next slide, this is uh, a reference for what a response would look like. Um, you can see that the response differs by age. That's along the horizontal axis. Those two bands with all the blue dots suggest a P1 waveform within normal limits by age. And that's judged according to the brain's, the speed of the brain's response to the sound, ba. I'm not gonna take more time to go over that, but I do wanna show you the results from our study on these 20 kids. Next slide. There you go. Um, you look at each individual child, 
Blue is a child in the in-person condition. Red is a child in the telepractice condition. And look, it's like every child's brain is heading toward, quote, within normal limits. Within those two black bands. Uh, so all of this says that the therapy was significantly helpful. And it didn't matter if you were in the in-person condition or the telepractice condition. And this is the kind of information our federal government wants to know to prove, to demonstrate that telepractice not only does no harm, but outcomes are equally as effective as in-person services. So some school age outcomes in the next um, slide. For my study here that I'm involved in, in its CU where uh, we have closed recruitment and we'll be analyzing our data for the next six months. So stay tuned for outcomes on 70 kids, not just 20. But there's some nice work being done for kids in school. Uh, a lot of these studies are on speech production or speech articulation. Sue Grogan Johnson in Ohio has published many studies looking at uh, kids' uh, progress in the telepractice condition, uh, similar progress to in-person on the Goldman Fristo test of articulation. The next study was um, looking at speech language therapy, uh, not just articulation, uh, similar progress in person in telepractice. Uh, Next bullet is in uh, speech sound disorders. Again, no difference in the two conditions. And the fourth study, uh, the same. And uh, these are all pretty recent um, uh, studies. Well, at least three of them are pretty recent. But Sue Grogan Johnson has some new stuff out since 2010. So if you're looking at is it effective? Um, there's a lot of data to suggest that it is if people are concerned about that. So barriers, if you go to the next slide, um, they kind of fall in these, four, these five areas and I feel like I've addressed attitudes sufficiently. So let me look at the other four. What about a technology failure like can't get through the firewall, or during a session the modem stopped working, or the computer crashed, or the audio failed, or the mics didn't work, or because of a bandwidth problem, the video freezes, or there's a difference in the delivery of the visual information and the sound. Basically the fix to all of this is having the information technology person on hand. Um, if you have no tech support, addressing all of that becomes more difficult and you'll need to go to your colleagues. Another fix is training so that the teacher or the teacher, uh, the uh, facilitator, the general education teacher, teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing, SLP, that they have some working knowledge. Remember, the kids are good at it. Maybe your facilitator has been received training on it. Um, you can also have plans for technology failures. And I think that that's really important to keep in mind because these things could happen. A storm could come in and something happens. Um, you're in a school and there's a classroom and everyone's on their computer and they're using up the bandwidth so that you don't have enough to have a good signal or a good synchronous signal. Things will happen. Have a plan beyond having a fix and being prepared in the ways listed here. Have a plan at the beginning of your session. Say, if we, the connection is dropped, I'm gonna text you. Or if the connection is dropped, you just disconnect, wait for me, I'll reconnect. Maybe I'll call you to let you know I'm back on. In other words, have a plan for a technology failure because it, it happens. Another area, next slide. 
um, let's say your facilitator didn't set up the equipment properly, didn't get the student to the session on time, uh, couldn't manage the student's behavior, didn't bring the therapy materials. These are all things that you might be asking the facilitator or e-helper or teacher that brings the child to the session to do for you. Well, there needs to be some training about roles and responsibilities before you launch into telepractice. Do your onboarding before your first session. Do a tech check, make sure everything's working and get, let them in on the plan for what should we do if we have a problem. Both sign off, sign back on, I'm gonna text you, et cetera. Um, and the next area. The problem is not having training. <laughs> the fixes are training, as we um, talked about, a mentor, practice a session with a friend. Um, maintain contact with um, the people that you're going to be working with. Calling, emailing, send speech practice materials to the kids. Send postcards home to tell them you send speech practice materials to the kids. Um, it's good to get training in advance and it's good to have training as you go. And with the environment, um, next slide. Um, be very careful about the feedback you give. Talk about it. Let them watch what you're doing. Um, Stay in touch with the general education teacher or your team, SLP, educational audiologist, teacher of the deaf, hard of hearing. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm kind of going quickly because I don't want to repeat myself too awfully much. Um, I'm going to advance uh, a couple of slides. You're welcome to read those practical tips, but uh, again, please. And one more time. And stop. In conclusion, how about that technology? When I said at the very beginning, the technology always lets us down. Hopefully, after this time together, you might say, well, the technology could let me down. But there are resources and increasingly easy to use software platforms to address that. Before you show the next one, the myth was families don't like telepractice. And if you push return now, maybe it's providers and service coordinators from our experience here in Colorado who are less comfortable with telepractice. Maybe it's not that the families don't like it. The next myth, telepractice is never as good as in-person sessions. But the research is showing maybe telepractice is no different than in-person services when it comes to the outcomes that students are demonstrating. And before you show the next one, one of the myths was telepractice is a good option when there are no other options. And what I'd like to propose after this talk, if you would advance the slide, is telepractice sometimes might be the best option, even when there are other options. Because maybe it's motivating to the kids, or maybe it's the way to develop a collaborative, consultative approach. Um, I think that that's maybe where we're heading, but I think in the next few years, we'll find out. Uh, the next several slides you don't need to show, but they're just all the references that I shared with you, which um, 
I'm happy to send copies or you can look them up if um, you like. And um, I have practically used every minute of this hour and 15 minutes, but if there are any questions, I am available. And you also have my email address on the very last slide and you're welcome to contact me outside of this um, time I've spent with you. Thank you, Arlene. I do have a question. Has there been, this is Sarah Burns, um, has there been any organization that required a certain percentage of their services be through telepractice? And has, was that successful? I, the only place I can think of is Australia, where they have basically said, this is our model. And it's been very successful, but not for a place like Colorado, where it's, we, we don't require it. We're simply supporting it. And that's more typical around the US and in other countries that I've been engaged with as well. Did that answer your question, Sarah? Yes, it does. Um, there's one more question. I don't know if it showed up on your, no, okay. It's I'm not. having a hard time seeing it, sorry. Um, are there rules in the United States about providing services outside of the provider's geographic zone of licensure, Colorado licenses, but providing services in Utah? Um, yes, for speech language pathologists and audiologists, because that is governed by the American Speech Language Hearing Association, which I think Canada follows those guidelines, at least British Columbia does. Um, ASHA requires speech language pathologists and audiologists to be licensed in the state in which the client resides. So we do have uh, providers, speech language pathologists and audiologists who are licensed in multiple states which is an issue. It's an issue for doctors as well. And there's an initiative in the medical community with something called portability so that you can be licensed in several states under an umbrella license, if you will. And uh, I think Ash is just standing by watching to see what happens there and is talking about doing something similar, but that's not advancing quickly. However, for teachers of the deaf and hard of hearing, there is not a governing body like that. And we do have teachers of the deaf and hard of hearing um, seeing kids through telepractice in other states who are only licensed in the state in which they, the provider, resides. Thank you. And I can't speak okay. to occupational therapists or physical therapists. I just don't know. Thank you. Yeah. I don't see any other questions. And I just want to thank you, Arlene, for the review, review of the research. research. And the practical suggestions. And I hope this um, PLC inspires people to embrace these ideas. And, oh, after 34 years of driving, I would like to get back into the practice with telepractice. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome. A pleasure. <laughs>